Hey, what's happening? It's that time of year where I'm getting nonstop te text messages from city council people who are running for re-election. That's always interesting. I happened to meet this guy in person the other day on the street. By the way, is this too much? Are these too much for what we're doing here? Too much? How about these? Is this better? I think this is much, much better. So this is going to be short, but all over the place. I made some notes and uh, this was just something that flitted, flitted, that's a word I invented, flitted into my head a couple of weeks ago and I thought this is probably something good to talk about. And I'm going to use myself as an example. However, I'm not saying that what I'm talking about is good or bad. I don't know exactly. I can tell you, and, and let's, just, let's just boil this down to the, to the crux right now. Let's talk about affirmation. Affirmation as a photographer, let's say. The thing is, I never needed it and I never wanted it, ever. However, I don't know if that's good or bad. I can tell you that for me personally, it's a really good thing and it's always been a good thing, but it may or may not be for you. So we need to talk about affirmation because it seems to be dictating much of our behavior and our careers at this point. So it's something, it's something important. By the way, just as a precursor here, <clears throat> I think a lot of times when people get into photography, the first people around them that may sort of offer affirmation would be their parents or their family. I, again, I didn't have it. I didn't need it. I didn't look to my family for this. My father's father was a journalist and he was a journalist and then he became a newspaper columnist and he wrote a column, column for like 30 years. He was a very well-known guy in the small community that they were from. Never made a ton of money, but he was very well-known, which was kind of his compensation. He and my father had this unbelievably combative relationship. They couldn't control my father. They sent him to military school when he was in middle school. He survived military school. He ended up getting thrown out of three universities, three major universities asked him not to come back. So their relationship was combative. So when I found journalism and photojournalism, my father was not happy. My father said, photography is a hobby at best. That's not a real job. It's a joke. Journalism is horrible. Do something else. Be an investment banker. My dad would cut out newspaper clippings when photographers got killed somewhere in the world. Some photojournalists got killed. And my father would write on the news clipping, this idiot probably deserved it. And then he would mail it to me. So in terms of affirmation from those closest to me, that's the kind of level of affirmation I was getting. But again, I didn't care. I got into the newspaper world and the newspaper world is insanely competitive. So as soon as it, newspapers in college were competitive, but when I got out and I got an internship and I started working at a big paper, it was a big paper that worked out of a dark room and there were two papers owned by the same company, a morning and an afternoon, that were ultra competitive. So not only did you have competition with the competing paper, and you'd show up on a scene somewhere, spot news thing, and there'd be a photographer from the competing paper, and your entire organization is over the top of you saying, without saying it, you better beat that person from the other paper. So it was hyper competitive. But then inside the paper, it was also hyper competitive because the good photographers were all battling it out for the best assignments. The newspaper world was so competitive and, it, and the, the dry, being driven by accolades and affirmation was what was driving some of the people. And when you're working as a newspaper photographer, there's a million things that can get you fired. If you get the name of a caption wrong, if you mislead the audience, if you fake something or fabricate something, if you stage an image, all these things, like it's made very clear to you if you're caught doing these things, you're going to be gone. I saw photographers doing that repeatedly. I saw photographers set up images. I saw photographers pay to set up images. I saw photographers pay civilians to keep other photographers out of an area so that the one photographer who was paying would be the only person that would have images from that spot. All of these are fireable offenses, and yet I saw it again and again because people were so driven by winning and driven by those accolades of being told, hey, you did it, you did it, you did it. For whatever reason, I never had that. I was always driven by being in the field making the pictures, and I didn't really care if the stuff ran in the newspaper. At the time, in the paper that I was working for, there was a college nearby in the neighboring town, a very well-known big 
American college. My guess is there's probably 40 or 50,000 students at that school. They had a journalism department. And when, it, when you did something well and your image ran in the paper, the head of the journalism department would cut it out and mail it to you with a little note saying like, hey, you killed it, way to go. You know, and, and in some ways, I would get, occasionally I would get one of those. And you'd be like, okay, well, at least this person has a history in journalism and photojournalism, so he's given you an accolade. I must have done something right. That, that felt pretty good. The other thing was when I'd be in the field working and I had my press credential and a civilian would come up and say, hey, are you so-and-so? And I'd say yes, and they'd say, oh, you did this image and that helped us or I knew that person or whatever. That was also kind of fun, but that was not the driving factor for me. I could care less. This paper I was working at had an in-house competition for a free enchilada dinner, okay? A free enchilada dinner. There were two photographers who almost killed themselves and almost killed each other trying to win cheese enchilada dinner. This affirmation of saying, wow, you did it, you get a cheese enchilada dinner, turn these guys inside out. Again, I never had it, but here's the twist on that. The fact that these folks did have it and the fact that you might have it is not necessarily a bad thing because needing the affirmation was what drove these people to do crazy things to get images. And again, some of what they did was unethical. Some of it wasn't. But that fire of needing to win, to get over on somebody else and to get affirmation made these people, not all but some, made them into incredible beasts of photography. Driven to a point that uh, is, would be terrifying, I think, to most people. I think some people would look at it and say, these people have mental health issues. They're so driven by getting pictures. I think that's legitimate. I think it was in some weird way, this, this drug of affirmation was kind of, um, it was a bit of a mental health thing. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not an expert. So I wanna talk about two kinds of affirmation. One that happened to me that I think is relevant and then something else, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint you a little picture here, by the way, milk oolong. Not for everyone, not a taste for everyone. In fact, some of you are gonna be the old socks thing. That smells and tastes like old socks. Burns the nostrils. Milk oolong. Let's, hypothetical. Let's say that I come to you and I say, look, I'm working on an app. The app, it's free. It's free, totally free. But here's the thing. This app is gonna target your body at a chemical DNA level, and it's going to begin to creep into your consciousness and your subconsciousness, and you're gonna have a really hard time not engaging with the app. When you wake up in the middle of the night and can't sleep, it's gonna be very difficult for you to stay off of the app. And by the way, I want you on it, I want your family on it, I want all your friends on it, and I want your children on it, and I want, it, I want your children on it at the youngest age possible. This app is gonna make you covet things you don't need or want. This app is gonna make you insecure. This app is gonna make you competitive. And oh, by the way, I'm gonna be tracking and selling off your data. So the more time you're on there, the better it is for me because I'm gonna make a ton of money on the side by selling basically your private information. And I, there's another thing I have to tell you. The, the company that owns us, the parent company, how do I put this mildly? Um, not exactly an up and up company. We may or may not have already been busted for doing a lot of unethical things around the world. And a lot of people consider us one of the most detrimental com companies ever when it comes to destroying the fabric of society. And this is around the world, by the way. So I can't exactly tell you that our parent company is good, but what I can tell you is we've already been busted for a variety of different things. But again, I need you on this app. I want you on this app, and I want your children on it as fast as possible. So just take a second and uh, think about it. Think about whether or not you want to come along with this with me. My guess is, if I came to you with that at this point in your life, you might be somewhat skeptical to get involved, to join in. And as we all know, the story that I was pitching there is a very real story that's already been around for a long time. This is a story now where when your children are interviewed, they say they would rather lose access to their voting rights than lose access to the app. My guess is you might be slightly hesitant to join in, but everybody all knows I'm talking about Facebook and TikTok, and these are things that have been, not Facebook, Instagram and TikTok, these things have been out there for a long time. 
and vast majority of you who are watching this, you're still on it, you're still using it. Everybody has an excuse for why they're on it, why they're using it. And I think one of the key elements for people who are photographers that are using this is obviously number one, to build following, but two, there's also this sense of affirmation. Now, the affirmation may come from bots and strangers and from a an e completely and utterly uneducated audience in regard to photography, but it's still a sense of affirmation. It's that little pat on the back. I'm gonna, it's when I watch a photographer work a scene and they shoot for five minutes and then they walk to the edge of the scene and they start posting from the scene. That is a bizarre, desperate need for affirmation that is kind of, I don't know, to me, it's not, it's past alarming. We passed alarming a long time ago. It's more baffling to me. And I'll give you a flip side of this equation. And again, I've never needed it. I never wanted it. I'm not saying that's a good thing. It's a good thing for me, but it may not be for you because this desire and insatiability for affirmation, even from bots and strangers, could be something that drives you to become somebody you aren't right now. And it could drive you to make something amazing. So this, this goes back maybe 20 years. I am, um, I'm somehow, I find myself in Virginia and I'm with a bunch of industry people and I get invited to a party. And this is not a regular party. This is an odd party. This is a party in the countryside at the house of a National Geographic photographer who lives in the country. And he's a guy that I had grown up in photography watching. I wanted to be him. He was to me, one of the coolest photographers out there. I loved his work. I loved his backstory. He seemed like he had a great personality. I didn't know him personally, but I knew people who knew him who were invited to the party and consequently I got invited. What I distinctly remember is having to park somewhere down this country road and walking to his property. And then somebody in a Land Rover picked us up and drove us across a river to get to his house. This legitimately happened to get to this party. The party would start at sundown and it would go all night long and there'd be huge bonfires that were built. And then during the early part of the evening, before it got too crazy, they would do these big outdoor projections. And I'd heard about this party for, for a long time, but I, I was like, I'll never get invited to that. So I somehow luck out, I get invited. And I also somehow, and I have no memory of how this happened. I get invited to show work at the projection. So I happened to be, I'd been working on a project for four years. I had the work and it had, it had been fairly well received. I was still working on it, but I was like, I think this is pretty decent. It would be fun to get some like feedback. Is this a good story, a bad story? What am I missing kind of thing? So the sun goes down and we're hanging out at this place and the projection starts and it's this massive outdoor projection screen. It's beautiful. And this is like a, uh, I guess you would call it an informal Nat Geo production. So they've got budget apparently to get a good screen and a good projector and a good sound system. So this thing starts and my work goes up on the screen. And now I'm standing in the back like I always am. I'm never the person that sits in the front. I'm always the guy drifting in the back. So that sort of the show sucks, I can flee out, out, a, out a side door. So I'm sitting there and a guy walks up in the dark next to me. And I look over and it's a Nat Geo photographer from LA where I was living at the time. We knew each other, but not, not super well, but we knew each other. So my work starts going and the crowd starts cheering. Good sign. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's fine. That's, that's great. So the show keeps going. Now a second person walks up next to me. I look over, it's another Nat Geo person. And then a fourth one walks up, the furthest person away, fourth one walks up, it's another Nat Geo person. But in this case, it is a Nat Geo legend. It is a guy that I watched the entire time I was coming up as a photographer. I had his books, I had friends who had his prints on the wall. This was a guy that my friends and I had discussed many, many times before. By this time, he probably had already had at least a 30 year career at Nat Geo. So he walks up. <laughs> My show ends, the Nat Geo guy from LA turns towards me. It's kind of quiet now. They're like in the midst of getting the next show ready to go. The guy from LA turns towards me, looks over at me in the dark and goes, Milner, was that your stuff? I said, yeah. And he, all he did, he just, he just nodded. He just, you can't see it, but he just kind of like winked and nodded. That was it. He never said a word other than that. He just winked and nodded. Based on who the guy is and what he'd done, that little wink and nod was significant. That was what I just saw worked. It worked and it had significance because of who that guy was, the track record. It's like Richard Petty watching you get pulled over on the freeway 
and driving by slowly and going, nice run, kid. Petty's a race car driver. He would know how to evade police. That would be a positive thing. Not like some random Yahoo driving by saying, you idiot, you should have pulled over. Who cares? So, but what happened next was the single most important thing. And, and what happened next was probably one of the most significant pieces of feedback I ever had. And one of the only things of affirmation that, that stuck with me after how many years ago was this? Probably 20 years ago, whatever. The guy on the far end, the legend, looks in, looks at me, and he says, quote, boy, you sure know how to put space together, unquote. And that was it. And then he walked away. And then they all walked away. And I never said anything to him. I did see the legend fall over a chair backwards later in the night, later in the evening. But it was, after all, a party. I'm not judging. And he's a legend. He can do whatever he wants. Boy, you can sure put space together. Again, the relevancy of that was because of who that person was. The hundreds of thousands of images that this person had looked at and edited over the years, and more importantly, the work that he had looked at that he tossed away that said, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. For him to look and say, in his own words, in his own colorful way, boy, you can sure put space together. It meant what you did was spot on. It was good. That was at a level that is going to command respect when people see that work. That is a kind of affirmation that you should be going for. And I know that some of you out there who are a little bit slippery, you're going to be saying, well, you had every advantage and you're so lucky and you had this and not. No, it's not. You can find your own legend. It doesn't matter where you are. And today, I didn't have internet back then. I didn't have the ability to like say, dude, can you look at my work online? You can find your own legend, whether it's at a portfolio review. I'm heading to Paris next week at Perry Photo. There's a ton of people that are going to be there who are at that level that if they looked at your work and said, look, you're onto something here or no, you need to go back to the drawing board, it will have relevancy instead of this stupid thing. Bots and strangers. Great job, great job, great job. It just does not have, if, if that's the drug you're chasing, and again, I'm not faulting you for chasing it because it might actually make you into somebody you're not right now and you could turn out to be the best photographer the world's ever seen because you're so driven by that affirmation hit that you will do things that you typically wouldn't do. I'm just saying chase the affirmation from people who actually know what they're doing and know what they're talking about. So it turns out that Arnold Schwarzenegger has a email newsletter. A friend of mine signed up for it. So thank you, Andrew, for sending me this. The, the, the particular email that he sent me sounded like I wrote it. And it turns out that Arnie was talking about something very similar. And Arnie was like, stop looking at your phone because the phone is filling you with other people's ideas and you're not taking enough time to understand what your own thoughts are. That's what I'm saying in part, but one step further, chase the affirmation. I don't care, chase it. Use it to your advantage, use that fire. It's see Thomas Howell in Red Dawn. All that hate's gonna burn you up, kid. Nope, keeps me warm at night. Great, as he's carving notches from dead Russians in his, in his rifle stock. Love that, that's commitment. That's the kind of commitment you have to have to be a photographer. You have to become C. Thomas Howell in Red Dawn. What was his name? I can't remember, but he was definitely, when I was a kid watching that movie growing up, I was like, I want to be C. Thomas Howell. So that's the thing. If you're going to chase affirmation, ch chase it from folks. Take the time to understand the people who are inside your community where you live right now. I guarantee it. There's probably a legend close by. It may, you may strike out trying to get in touch with them. You may strike out and have them looking at your work, but be persistent, be patient, keep making great work and put it out there. So if you're gonna chase it, chase the dragon, baby. Chase the dragon that matters and don't flit around with a bunch of strangers who are gonna give you a, a hit on a like button. It means nothing. It means nothing. I'm going back to these. Very serious now. Anyway, that was supposed to be short. It's 19 minutes, which for me is short. Again, milk oolong. It tastes like oolong tea that has milk in it, but there is no milk in it. I have this tea because I convinced someone else to buy it and they hated it and they gave it to me. And if I'm honest, and I always am, I kind of thought there was a 50-50 chance they would hate it and give it to me. Even though I wanted them to like it because I like it, 
I knew that it's not for everyone and I ended up with it. Do I feel bad? No, I feel like I made the right move. And now my brain is like, what else can I trick this person into buying that I will tell them I, I like that they may not like and I will, I will get it, a Lamborghini. I saw an orange Lamborghini in town. Maybe I'll ask it would match my glasses. How cool would that be? All right, I have to go. I'm getting a barrage of messages and um, Jesus. I got, a, I got a, a lot to do in a limited time. I appreciate you being here. And again, I'm one person with one opinion. I'm trying to help you go from whatever level you're at right now to a more distinguished level, if that's what your thing is. Even just knowing where you stand. Is my work decent or do I still have a lot more work to do? That's such a refreshing thing to know and understand. It can be sobering. But at the same time, I think most of you, if you were told, you know what, you got to work harder, you got to go back, you got to start over, I think most of you would do it. I think you would double down, dig in, and you would get out there and make better work. And that's what really what this is about. This is a public service. Did I mention that? It is. Bye.